Santa Cruz, located on the central coast of California, is a small seaside community with a little over 60,000 residents. The beauty of the coast, ringed by redwood-studded mountains, has been a magnet to many for generations. Santa Cruz is known for its surfing lifestyle as well as being a bastion for tech-savvy creativity. The ideal temperate climate and all of this beauty comes at a cost, however, and Santa Cruz is one of the most expensive places to live in the U.S. Median house prices are just over $600,000. Santa Cruz is currently struggling to come to terms with the homeless population, which according to applied research, rose 28% in 2013. This puts the total homeless population at 3,536, with some estimates being much higher. Santa Cruz filmmaker Brent Adams has been working on an idea that he calls Sanctuary Camp, which would provide a safe place to sleep as well as other services to homeless people within the community. Brent wanted to collect some data from other operating homeless encampments along the Pacific Coast and curious myself, I went along with him to document the trip. The first camp that we visited was unsanctioned and not necessarily the model that Brent is using for his sanctuary camp, but it was good to get a baseline. We're in Eugene, Oregon. This is the first stop, the first homeless camp that we're finding on our Northwest tour as we're looking for sanctuary camps. It looks like a temporary homeless camp, about 30 to 50 tents across the street, a kitchen, uh, two porta potties. A very busy street at a highway on ramp um, up against a large uh, concrete cinder block building. Looks like a good location, probably very loud with traffic though. Brent went in to talk to some of the camp residents while I took a comprehensive tour with Whoville resident Karen. My personal name is Karen Taronis. And I came to be a part of Whoville uh, because I'm homeless and I felt drawn here. And I really love the concept because it's community-based, you know, and it's really also helping to re-educate people and reacclimate them to living in society. So here we are, what's lovingly called Whoville Number no. 9 Revisited. They keep citing us, or they were, for a couple of months, and so far they've let us stay here about two months, though they did put two camping prohibited signs up on the walls, one there and one over there. We try to keep the walkways clear as much as possible. There are too many people here. Um, 20 to 30 would probably be much more ideal, but we can't exactly turn people away. Okay, so that's kind of the main entrance. We're a little haphazard. And then we have our paths going around this way. Think about disabled. We have two people in wheelchairs, a lot of people who have a hard time walking. We try to keep the center for community events and we really ideally we've been trying to get all the tents around the outside and then we want to put up fencing like they have in Portland. Lovely fencing that they did with doors. And there's a whole bunch of wood that somebody donated for us because we're always cooking. That's a community tent that we let a lot of overnighters, you know, late night people just show up and all they've got is a sleeping bag and a tarp. And so we let them go in there, but we asked them to roll it up and go ahead and leave. And this would be the final pathway out. Getting better all the time. Back on the sidewalk. Ta-da! I've been out on the road myself about a year. It began in Florida for me. I had a home for 15 years, at two acres, and 10 years I took care of that myself. Um, my three children, two of whom are also disabled. And it just income, the bank and crash, um, I couldn't take care of that home anymore and then I lost it and um, then I was renting for a while but when I went to become a renter I had no rental history because I'd been a stay-at-home mom for 10 years and everything that I'd hoped and invested in was that home and that lamp. All the stories are so varied I, I mean they really are. Um, the commonality is that we are unhoused. It didn't mean we became unhuman and somehow they forget that. I want people to know there's a Heavenly Father that loves them and He didn't choose this for them. But He will walk through it with us and He will help us shine. Brent continued touring Whoville and talking to more of its residents, including a young pregnant woman who said that Whoville was the only place where she felt safe. She succumbed to the high cost of medical treatment after getting hit by a car and suffered life-threatening physical injuries. Unable to pay the bills, she became homeless. I walked to all of the surrounding businesses to see how the camp had affected them. There were no major complaints and many businesses said they actually saw an increase in revenue. The owner of the small Mexican restaurant directly next door said the business boomed when they had their taco special for only a couple of dollars. 
One woman that worked at the convenience store said that a couple of camp residents even walked her home each night for safety. We found the unsanctioned camp to be interesting, but we were curious to visit the Opportunity Village to see how a sanctioned and funded camp is run. Opportunity Village is the brainchild of 26-year-old Andrew Heben, who did his master's thesis on organized tent cities. Background checks for residents are mandatory, as is following the rules. No drinking, no drugs, and no violence. To be on the grounds, you have to sign in and be escorted by a resident at all times. My name is Catherine Griffith. I actually got married here on uh, Halloween. I am on the council. Um, I'm also the head of the admin committee, um, computer lab, and probably something I'm missing. Very good support from the community. Uh, when the city had their use uh, hearing for this location, nobody spoke against us, nobody. Uh, the, the arbitrator, he said he'd never seen that happen at any any hearing he'd been to before that nobody spoke against it. Uh, my name's Andrew Heben and we're here at Opportunity Village Eugene. It's been open for about three months now and there's 30 people living here in uh, I think 27 micro housing structures. Like many other camps it started as a protest camp but quickly became like a place of refuge for those in the city without a place to be so um, if Occupy did one thing I think it really catalyzed uh, the issue of homelessness and the realization that people need a safe place to be. So the city's compromise with shutting down that camp was to form a task force on homeless solutions where they're specifically trying to find new and innovative ways to deal with uh, the issue of homelessness and it brought together people, you know, diverse stakeholders from throughout the city. Well, my name's Craig and uh, I came here in the end of September and um, I just started volunteering and, and uh, found a place to stay through that and just started uh, contributing to the, to the project. The village has a council uh, comprised of five people and I'm on that council as well. And uh, we're just building bungalows and sheltering people. Would you like to see inside? Before inspection we kind of uh, discourage people from moving their stuff in and, and uh, leave, leave it uh, visible for the inspector to come and see. Um, and uh, once that's done, uh, folks move in. Uh, this, this particular unit has a loft and uh, loft, loft space is uh, designed for storage um, and it really keeps a lot of the floor space open just by having a lot. We're building a lot more than just the structures here. It's, um, we're, we're building community together and, and uh, through building community it's, uh, it's more like a support network for ourselves and each other. It's building cohesion not only in this village um, but it's building cohesion between the unhoused and the housed, and uh, building cohesion between the greater community and this community. So one of the ways we were able to build all these structures and kind of get around the code is that they're not hooked up to any utilities. Um, once you hook up to water and electric, that's when a lot of the serious code requirements kicked in. So, um, so the yard also serves as like a central heated gathering space. We have a pellet stove in there. They make and distribute these stoves in a lot of thir third world countries. They're uh, super efficient biomass stoves. Um, they create 90% uh, 90, 90 less smoke and they also like a little stick like this will like heat this entire uh, pot of water. It was refreshing to be in a community that makes finding alternative solutions to homelessness a priority. The citizens of Eugene came together to support their most needy neighbors. They realized that by enacting more laws which target the poorest citizens in their community wasn't only a waste of public resources, but it does nothing to tackle the root causes of homelessness. We just visited Opportunity Village in Eugene and it's filled with micro homes. Uh, we've really been inspired. Uh, it's, it's beyond our imagination how awesome it is, how beautiful the structures are beautiful the community is. They've had unlimited uh, unanimous support in city council. The, the neighborhood is happy with it. Tons of community support. So uh, something that we're going to be hope, hopefully working towards in Santa Cruz. Uh, they seem to make it look easy here. They're, they're constructing beautiful uh, bungalows and conestogas. They have uh, a heated yurt, kitchen area, they're building a bathroom and it looks, uh, looks highly doable. After our inspiring visit to Opportunity Village, I was reminded how important community is. The people that we had met on our journey this far may be monetarily poor, 
but the richness of their community was something that I hadn't felt in my own hometown for quite some time. As a massive cold front descended on the west coast, we were met with snow and temperatures well below freezing. As we made our way to Portland to visit Right to Dream 2, I turned the heater in the car full blast and I couldn't help but think of all of the people sleeping outside. We're heading down to Right to Dream 2. It's a safe sleep spot in downtown uh, Portland uh, where people can sleep for eight hours, three shifts of eight hours. They have porta potties, a dumpster. It's not a camp, it's just a place where people can go to sleep so they're not sleeping around the sidewalk in downtown Portland. They accommodate several hundred people. Uh, it's done with the uh, approval of the city, participation of the city, but they are trying to find a new location now. I'm standing at a fifth floor window looking down at Right to Dream 2, a homeless camp in Portland, Oregon. One of the things we wonder all the time is why Portland seems to be a mecca for homelessness. Our homelessness count is going up, skyrocketing, uh, especially women and children, 22%, 25%. And a lot of the people come here from all over the country, especially California, the Pacific Corridor, and we cannot figure out why. The uh, location for the camp was a porn shop, which uh, came down in uh, due to a lot of reasons, but it was torn down, became a gravel lot, and the city didn't allow the owner to develop it for food carts, develop it for a parking lot, so the owner decided he would give it over to the homeless people. And for two years the city has fought it, but now the city is looking at supporting uh, the homeless by moving them into a warm warehouse at $10,000 $10, a month, uh, so they won't be freezing. Uh, tonight it's supposed to be 19 degrees outside. It's a sober camp. It's a dry camp. They have enough money, they raise enough money so that they can do things like have sanitary conditions and porta potties and so we've had no we've had no problem whatsoever. Well, unfortunately, homelessness is such a horrible problem here that we still have people in doorways all over the place. The city should provide more space for people like this. It was humbling to talk to these incredible people who are working tirelessly to help make life better for the most vulnerable people in our society. We drove north to Portland and to our next location, a place called the Dignity Village. Um, well, I'm Scott and we're here at Dignity Village. Uh, Dignity Village is it's a place to uh, come and get uh, help you get back on your feet. We've been here 13 years, uh, into our 14th year, and I, I would assume thousands of people come through here in 13 years to get back on their feet. Some go back to the street, but most people go to housing. So that's what we consider that success. So uh, We have micro-businesses. People come in and buy wood. They come in and buy stuff that we get for donations at our yard sale. Um, we take recycling back. Um, we try to sell stuff out of our garden. There are several different ways that we try to make money. We pay all of our electric water, sewer, garbage, and all that type of thing um, by donations and by stuff that we sell. Uh, this greenhouse, a gentleman got a grant to uh, uh, build a greenhouse. Da Vinci Art School came and they helped us build it. And they painted the windows and a villager painted the uh, the greenhouse. Uh, yes. Right now, uh, residents, we have just right around 58 to 60, but we uh, are keeping six to eight extra in our warming shelter right now. So we have almost 70. For uh, people like us in their, in their uh, late 40s, early 50s, have a hard time getting a job because all the young people come and, you know, I mean, they're getting, they're getting the jobs and, and we're old enough to where we're looked at, uh, at quite as terrible as, as a younger person. So it's hard to get a job at, at this age bracket. Local artists will come in and uh, see an empty wall and want to do a mural and uh, uh, so we are paint it, it helps brighten up the village, it's kind of neat, it gives things to talk about. Uh, the, that's representations of the cave uh, walls in Europe. Um, we have a dragon over here in the corner, our uh, forest scene. Um, we have Noah's Ark is up here around the corner. We have five basic rules. Uh, one and two will get you uh, 86 immediately. That's no theft and no violence, uh, period. Any at all is uh, done in the village, you're automatically out. And what, by the time you come back, you'll have 72 hours to, re to, to leave. Um, that's all, you get no second chances on that. Uh, number three is no drugs or alcohol, we don't allow it in the village. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't go have a beer or something and come home, but uh, then you're not encouraged to hang around. Because number four is no constant disruptive behavior. We don't like a lot of people out uh, voicing their opinions and yelling and screaming on the on the tarmac because uh, that just, it takes away from trying to, to do what you're supposed to do. Um, so, so that's number four. And number five is everyone must contribute 10 hours of community service back to the village. Um, that's how the, uh, the house repairs get done. Uh, that's how the village gets cleaned up, picked up, the garbage emptied, our commons cleaned. Um, everyone does security. So everybody does uh, hours in the village. To, uh, uh, that's how we pay our rent.
Temperatures continued to drop into the single digits, and snow fell heavily at times as we left Dignity Village to head north. Giving people who are homeless a secure sense of place can help them heal from the spiral that led to their situation. Camps and micro-villages seem to bridge a necessary gap between sleeping in the streets and permanent housing. Here we are at Olympia, Washington at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. On the grounds they have a what's called Camp Quixote. It's a nice model because they have a, a fence around it uh, with one entrance portal, one entrance gate. They've got the porta potties and the gar uh, recycling and garbage out front. And there is a housing community right across the street. And it, lo it looks, looks like it's a good neighbor. Probably a model that Santa Cruz would like to duplicate. Hi, I'm Becky. I go by Skull Lee. Welcome to Camp Coyote. In each one of these tents ha homes three people. They've got walls up to kind of give you privacy. Not great for insulation, so a lot of us have blankets hanging up. Robert, yeah. is it cool if we come in and see inside? Yeah. You guys want to come in? All right, here we go. On in there. Oh. Small spaces, but it's better than... Yeah, Robert, this is my home. This is my little domain right here and stuff. I'm just trying to keep it as clean as I can, you know? Um, I'm a, I'm a dire Seahawk man. I've uh, been homeless twice in my life. I've uh, lived in tents, and lived in the rain, the shine, the snow, sleet, everything like that. And right here, you know, the wind blows like that, still stays together and such, you know. We got friends here to help out get each other and stuff, you know. We all cook for each other, stuff like that. Basically, it's, it's better than living on the streets. You know, just the tarps kind of covering for rain or um, whatnot. There's a house. Um, different entrances into each of the houses. Um, some have doors. Other ones are just a zipper up. This is our, our dishwashing station. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but because of the cold weather, we have to keep the water running so it doesn't freeze. Because it is getting below freezing out here. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of everybody's got their own little area. Not much for storage. I mean, we don't have storage areas. This is our last and final room, <laughs> and we're gonna have to duck to get under. It is the only actual tent still here. Um, and that's my room, because I was the last resident here. But here we have an actual tent, tarped and plasticed in to keep some of the heat in. Um, very small quarters. And normally we'd have the tarp up higher, but it's temporary. We're moving to our new spot soon, so I can't wait to get in there. Uh, I'm Erin, and this is Little Olympia, Washington, <laughs> homeless camp. Quixote resident Erin nervously led us to her home. Living on the streets is a dangerous place, especially for women. Nearly all of the female residents in the camps that we had visited this far told us that it was the only place where they felt safe. Um, it's good as a stepping stone. Like, we're not on the streets, and um, we're wait like, I'm on a wait housing waiting list, and instead of just on the streets. And it's really safe here. You have um, camp desk person, watchman, all 24 seven, so, yeah. I can't wait to get out of here. Uh, it's nice, you know, you got heat power, but it's like a tent. <laughs> my name's Julie Montgomery, and my title's resident advocate. And my role at the camp is just to assist people, kind of whatever they need as far as getting services, and, um, they set up goals when they come into camp. We check in monthly on their progress on the goals and just see how I can help them. For a lot of people, it's been housing to get into permanent supportive housing. Um, some of it's been helping people reconnect with family, which is a really important thing to do and um, one of the my favorite parts of the job. Helping people apply for benefits because the system is just so difficult and really set up for people to have to fight their way through it. And when you're talking about people who have, you know, mental illnesses and substance abuse issues, it's just, um, I mean, I feel like I'm a fairly stable person and it just drives me crazy. Like, they really try to make it hard. And so one of the best things about this is just the community and feeling connected to people. A lot of people have come to the woods, um, from the woods here and they just feel less isolated, they feel safer. I had one couple in camp who um, had fallen out with their family and, and got them connected and they got, they, it's just like kind of what they needed was um, time to get back, you know, make these connections with their family and then they got jobs and went back to school. And, 
You know, so some, for some people it can be just a really, like, a stabilizing place to be. Scully agreed to take us to the site of the new Quixote Village, which, as you'll see, is an incredible example of what can be accomplished when a community comes together in a positive way. Uh, today's the only day that I haven't been out here to paint, but I've been out here painting every day since we've been allowed to. And uh, it's so fun. It's just awesome. So this is one of the ones that is fully painted and almost ready for the bedding. And this is also where we store all the paint. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's not big. It's not the biggest thing in the world, but it is a heck of a lot bigger than a tent. You get the walls, you get your windows that open and shut. Um, if you come back this way, again, this is a bigger, this is one of the bigger cabins. Okay, so we've got, what, what's gonna be in here is like a, a water heater and then our storage closet. And then in this area, we're gonna have a toilet and a sink. So we'll have um, like our own bathrooms. So we're gonna come in three and take a peek. This is another one that's finished. And this is a little bit smaller. Um, and then it's my understanding that there's going to be possibly a bed, I think it's going to go like right here, built into the wall, and then we'll have like a little desk and a chair. Um, but there's not, again, there's not much storage space, but it's, you know, it's a lot better than the woods. It's going to be pretty. Yay. My name's Steve, and I go to the Unitarian Church, and I was asked by one of the board members who's coordinating this thing to take over managing the painting because we have a strict time schedule trying to get them all done by the 14th. Our church is very involved in um, the community and, 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 and has been involved in Camp Quixote for years and so when there's a permanent village it's like wow how cool is that. Nobody should be homeless and it's 20 degrees outside so I mean this is this is a nice spot. Man. Every little dot on the map has homeless people. It's just a sign of the times. And some people, it's really through no fault of their own. I know people have lost their homes because of the, uh, uh, the financial crunch in 08, you know? I mean, they just, bad investing, bad information from people. Yeah, those types of things. So, hey, how do you get some of you to embrace the fact that there's homeless? I don't know. I don't know how you do that. But, you know, people ought to get up off, get off their, uh, you know, ivory towers and say, hey, you know, I've got it pretty good, but some people don't, and why not, you know, lend a hand to somebody who doesn't have what you have. I mean, that seems like a pretty noble effort. We left the Quixote Village just as the temperature was dropping to well below freezing. Listening to all the varied stories of how people became homeless was emotionally draining. Medical issues, substance abuse, and financial troubles spawned by the recession all topped the list. The tales of homelessness made me realize just how precarious our lifestyles really are. We headed north to Seattle to visit the itinerant camp called Tent City 3. Tent City 3 is privately funded and houses about 100 people for only $3,800 per month. It is currently located at a church in the middle of an upper-class neighborhood, and the stories of generosity from local residents were incredible. One neighbor even roasted a truckload of chickens and donated them to the camp for Thanksgiving. Our tour guide Tom was a little camera shy, but the other residents talked him into giving us the tour. We thought he did great. We have a donations tent. People donate stuff. Oh. We got women's side and men's toiletries. Pretty groovy. These are all single people tents. Looks really cool in the, in the morning, they're all frosted over. Yeah, Thanksgiving was crazy. When we first show up, they, we have a community meeting. We, we like put a little flyer on each house and invite everybody. So one of them actually wanted us to stay a month longer. We met some great people on our journey. And though not a perfect solution, these various camps at least provide the basic infrastructure needed for survival. Human waste is properly dealt with and garbage cans ensure that refuse is kept out of the wildlands where homeless encampments often spring up. 
Addiction and mental health services can be utilized more easily and a whole community of peer support is close at hand. There are hundreds of reports documenting homeless use of emergency rooms to merely get warm or have a meal. Clearly this is the wrong venue and highlights a systemic failure. I can imagine that where these camps are located, both the emergency medical system and law enforcement would be less taxed. On our way back south to Santa Cruz, we decided to visit the very first camp that we toured on our trip and see how the residents were coping with the extreme weather that they'd been experiencing for the past week. They had built a warming tent in the middle of the camp and many residents were huddled inside when we arrived. It was nine degrees in Eugene that night.